Welcome to Gateway Sermons, and thank you for joining us as we venture together through God's Word. It's funny, kids, kids find out very early <coughs> in their lives that sometimes they can get what they want just by being annoying, just by asking over and over and over and over again until you just break, and they know that, I think, they, but so often, I mean, I, I experienced it just last night with, with, with my son. He wanted this. Uh, he had, uh, uh, he lost a tooth earlier in the week, and uh, the, uh, the tooth fairy um, left a dollar under his pillow, and so from the minute he found that, he's been asking to buy this bag of gummy soda pop candy, I don't know, and uh, he must have asked me between, what morning was it that he... he had the dollar Wednesday or Thursday. From since then, he's probably asked me, literally, four thousand seven hundred eighty-nine times, <laughs> if he could go buy that bag of candy. And last night we were on our way back from the store, and we just broke and we went to Walmart and got that bag of candy. But <laughs> in this text, Jesus, interestingly enough, invited his disciples, encouraged them to pray in faith, knowing that God listened, knowing that God would give them justice. And God's unshakable commitment to his people is the foundation of all our prayers and the hope in all of our pain. So we look to the text this morning, Luke chapter 18, beginning at verse 1. It says, he told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. So Luke very plainly provides us with exactly the point of this parable and therefore the point of these first few verses. I think the first two sections, we could look at them together. Both are by no accident or coincidence about prayer, but they're also one through eight and then nine through whatever the the end of the next parable is. They are two closed units also, and so we'll look at them separately. But God desires, we know from that opening verse before we even know the story, God desires that his people would never lose heart, never lose hope or confidence in him to the point that they would even stop praying, which means they've lost all confidence that he cares about them. That's why you would stop praying. He's not listening. He doesn't care. That's what this parable is for. And Jesus wants his disciples to know this. So he tells them a story in verse two. He said, in a certain city, there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man. So he's not a good man, he's not a wise man, he's not a kind man. And there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him and saying, give me justice against my adversary. Now, once again, widows were an extremely marginalized group in ancient societies in particular. They were completely alone. And that meant for them at that time, that was a major concern for them, that they had no male protection in that culture. They had no male representation or resource. A widow then was basically helpless. She was, for the most part, totally dependent on others. And Luke has been very careful throughout the gospel (coughs) to show widows as the object of special love and care from God. We've seen it several times, chapters 2 and 4, and then we'll see it again in 20 and 21, and then here in chapter 18. If the central theme of Luke is good news for the poor, there's a very good reason, a very clear reason that widows are in the forefront of this book, that they're always showing up, so to speak, in Luke. God wants to show through Jesus his care for those in particular who have no other resource but him. For those whose only option would be to be completely dependent on God. Verse 4, for a while he, the judge, refused. But afterward he said to himself, Though I neither fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice, so that she will not beat me down by her continual coming. So the judge finally acts, but you realize very clearly he's acted out of self-preservation. He doesn't even act out of basic human dignity or compassion that you would think would be here in some respect. That's not the reason at all. He's, he's just thinking, if I don't give this woman justice against her adversary, 
If I don't defend her cause, she's never going to quit. She's never going to leave me alone. She might cause problems for me later, in fact. So he's forced into a predicament against his will where he has to help this woman even though he has no desire to help her. There's no compassion here whatsoever. Verse 6, And the Lord said, Hear what the unrighteous judge says. So God uses this very cold, indifferent man to say something to us about himself. I won't give you justice. That is, I won't vindicate you. I won't finally save you because you simply annoy me and push me into a corner. That's not how God listens. That's not how he receives or the grid through which he gets prayer. I will give you justice because you are mine, we find out in verse 7. And will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Now again, the judge in the story acted completely out of self-preservation, not love. How much more? If, if an indifferent, cold, uncompassionate man can be pushed into helping somebody, how much more, that's the implication here, how much more will God bring about justice for his suffering people? There's the assumption there that this is based on, God's answering then is based on a relationship. The judge had no heart whatsoever for the widow. Jesus here refers to God's people as his elect his chosen ones. He deliberately possessed them and made them his own. He willingly took on the responsibility, so to speak, of having to hear and address the burdens of people. So it's really an amazing thing. God, God is not responding to us out of obligation. It's not what he's doing. That's not ever what God has done. So it's a very strange thing then in the text for it to be talking about God giving us justice. I mean, we don't really want justice from God. It's the last thing we want from God, but something has happened that has turned the tables for these elect ones that God will give them justice. God is saying in this parable, I will do right by you. Don't worry. Don't worry. This is what Jesus came to secure for us, the love of a heavenly Father. Because the point of the parable is that God is nothing like this unrighteous judge. Nothing. He never gets backed into a corner with us. Why does he promise us justice? Why does he promise that he won't delay over us? Because we're his very own possession. His elect but when you consider our lives and how hard life can be and how often we might pray or how tired we might get of praying, if you've ever been there, you start to realize that this is something, verse 8 is something that takes faith to believe. A life lived in belief and dependency, if that's our default position to realize that we are in constant need, that's going to take faith, enduring faith, to believe. So listen to what Jesus says here in the middle of verse 8. Nevertheless, so even though that's true, when the Son of Man comes, which is what he's been talking about now in 17 there at the end, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? So he relates prayer to Faith, when the Son of Man comes, even though God wants us to continually come to Him and not lose heart, and He is there, and He has chosen us, and He loves us, when the Son of Man comes, is anybody going to be believing that? That's not altogether inspiring, is it? Even though verse, the first part of verse 8 is a true statement, when the Son of Man comes in his day, will there be anyone among us that actually believes it? That's a very interesting thing considering how confident we can become in our own exercise of faith or good works. That we, we, we become so presumptuous based on whatever standards we created when Jesus is saying, 
Yeah, I, I don't know. When I return, I don't know what I'm going to find, so to speak. Do we really think God is not aware then of how hard it is to have faith? Or do we honestly think that enduring faith is easy? Jesus doesn't. Jesus does not think that enduring faith that never loses heart and never walks away is an easy thing to pull off. He wonders out loud if there will be any to find when he returns. So, so much for our delusions of grandeur about how God is honored by our commitment level. Jesus is like, I don't know if anyone is going to believe in me when it's all said and done. Enduring faith here is defined as a continual coming, isn't it? So, so it's, it's exercising. It's constantly coming before the Father, crying out day and night. It's almost described as the audacity of a person to so dependent and needy that they are crying to him day and night. Well, what if, what if, generally speaking, that's the life of a believer in this world? What if that's what it's going to be like? What if we are so unlikely to find safety, security, satisfaction, stability, or salvation here that we begin to realize that as time goes on and we just never stop running to him? What if that's what our lives are going to be like? What if you're not the odd man out if you're constantly in need? What if it's a show where people make you think that there's this, way, this, this level of faith you can get to where you're just untouchable? What if that's not really the way it is? What if the actual issue is that the train wrecks are the norm so what if he's saying you'll never stop running and I'll never stop listening what if it's just really that precious and beautiful in this text the point of this story is to give us a reason in the midst of our need in the midst of our desperation in this world, to never stop crying to him day and night and to never doubt that he is going to give us justice. That he will make all things right. That he will make everything completely whole. Now, how many of us, if we're honest, have ever prayed so much for something or during a certain time and it feels like you never really got an answer? You prayed and you prayed and you prayed or you prayed very specifically for something to go one way and it went the opposite way. How many of us just inside as we think through have had that happen to us and have found ourselves struggling to believe that God really sees us or cares for us or loves us. So when we hear this text, we think, okay, maybe that's for somebody else. Have you ever felt like God has been delaying an answer, let alone what he calls in this text, justice? Like he's going to fix everything. And maybe there's something you're walking through this morning or have been walking through for a while that makes you doubt when you hear this text, rather than feel hope and confidence. And Jesus, by the way, Jesus is not talking here about us insisting on our own way in prayer, and finally, God will give us what we want. If we just say it and pray for it long enough and hard enough, well, then he's just bound to give us whatever we want. That's not what the text is after at all. That kind of praying would come from a place of self-confidence, wouldn't it? It would come from a sense of certainty that what you want is so good and so right that God is honor-bound, obligated to give it to you. That wouldn't reflect the heart of this text at all. It's not what prayer is, prayer is for. Prayer is not to bend the will of God into your own. The widow in the story is in need of justice. And because we know she's a widow, what we know is that she, she is, isn't trying to get anything except deliverance. She's coming to this judge because he has the power to make something right that she cannot make right on her own. She cannot fix her own situation. She's completely dependent on the judge. That's the point of it being a widow. 
So this text then is about faithful perseverance to the end when the answer is delayed. For the most part, beloved, that is what's normal. And when you think about it, when, when, if for the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years is as one day, God's definition of intervening speedily might not be the same as ours when we see that word. There's something eye-opening here about how hard then, if we're honest, completely dependent, enduring faith will be. It is apparently so rare and so unlikely that even Jesus wondered if he would find any when he returned to gather his elect as it says in Matthew 24, 31, from the four winds. Now, to be clear, I do not think Jesus is saying this because he genuinely doesn't know. Like, like I, I, just, I, just, I don't know. I, I don't think that's what's happening at all. I think the rest of Scripture would keep us from believing that. I think he's saying, and I think he's teaching his disciples, something about misplaced confidence in ourselves. That, that, that we just believe that we're going to reach some point where believing what we cannot see is just easy. Now, I understand that over time, you grow in confidence and hope in knowing that God is there, even when the answers aren't clear. But what has that taken? Experience. Time. Don't think this isn't hard. Beloved, elect, believing ones. The Christian life is not going to be filled despite what books might tell you or really popular speakers might tell you or conference after conference after conference might tell you or study after study might tell you. The Christian life is not going to be filled with amazing thing after amazing thing. It's not going to be mountaintop after mountaintop after mountaintop that just makes it easier and easier for you to believe because everything is so obvious She was crying out day and night. Jesus is assuming something in life that is so difficult, you begin to doubt everything, which is why the encouragement comes in this text. That's the norm. And and we, we we tend to paint our Christianity in colors that make it so hard for weak and struggling people to hang on because they think they're missing out, they're missing something. No, that's the norm. The Christian life is going to be marked mainly with things that become so crushing and difficult that you end up crying to him day and night. That's that's the beauty of the word of God. That's the beauty of the Psalms. The Psalms are, are, I don't know if I can make this statement, but the Psalms are probably the book in the Bible where where you could see yourself the most realistically, right? It's not, not in Proverbs. I mean, it's, it's, I mean Proverbs is great, but you're, you're not really going to see yourself. You're going to think, oh, well, I've, I've done that one, and I've never done that one. And the thing it said not to do there, that's what I usually do. And, you know, it just, it just can be weighty. The Psalms are, it's beautiful to know the Psalms are inspired, that, that words like that are inspired. That's, that's real life experience with God in a difficult world. We need to be ready then, as Christians, generally speaking, for life to kick the tar out of us. That's not pessimism. Uh, The the, the victorious Christian life people are going to come running in. Don't talk like that. No, no, no. Stop. Stop it. Maybe you have the resources and and the, the applause and the time to think that everybody could have the great experience you do. But for most people, life is really hard. So away with all this nonsensical, unbiblical, and I'll stand behind that, self-serving, victorious Christian life talk. The victorious Christian life has nothing to do with my circumstances. It has nothing to do with my skill level. My life is victorious because it is hidden in Christ with God. And cannot be taken away because he holds me there by his blood and by his righteousness. Am I victorious? Yes, in Christ. Because of Christ. 
My life is victorious because nothing can separate me from his love. That's what makes my life victorious. In all these things, we are more than conquerors, Romans 8 says. Not outside of them. Not once you get through them. Not if you can avoid them. In all these things, all this suffering, heaviness, we are more than conquerors. We've been sent into the world, beloved, as sheep to be slaughtered. And in all this, we are more than conquerors through him who loves us. So we, we find in a text like this, we find as we take it to the rest of Scripture that we as believers have one great hope, beloved, one thing to stake our lives on, to stake our futures on, and it's this, that our God does not lie. That's where my confidence comes from. I will be finally saved and vindicated and justified because he has promised to do it. He's promised in this text to give justice to me. That's my hope. You see how a life of prayer is directly related then ultimately to the amount of dependency I do or don't feel in any given moment. That's really what's driving a prayer life, whether or not you feel dependent or it's directly related to the amount of dependency you feel, if we can break it down that distinctly. And, and in this, listen, I'm, I'm not arguing or trying to push you to establish legal guidelines for prayer, that like you have to pray a certain amount of time a day or a certain amount of, of times per day. I'm not arguing for that. I'm not saying that. Now, if, if that's what you do, and you, you do have to schedule it each day, or you do that, don't feel like that's unspiritual or something. Don't feel like that's second rate. I have to schedule my prayer time. Or I, that, that's fine. If that's what you have to do, that's fine. That's really not my point here. Really like the, how many times or how long it is each time. He remembers our frame. He knows that we are but dust. I'm asking you, what, what, I, what I hope to do is, is have the word draw out your heart. How dependent are you on the provision and the hand and the power and the blood and the righteousness of Jesus just to breathe every day, let alone get through whatever you're going through? Most of us, I think, or many of us are just fine on our own. We're very good at managing our lives, and I'm not... I'm not saying that sarcastically. You may be very good at managing your life and keeping it together, which is a good thing. That's not a bad thing. But if that's the case, we're, we're pretty fine on our own, and then prayer becomes what you do when there's something you can't do on your own, right? When, there, when, when, when you have to get something or accomplish something or you need something to happen that you are powerless to do yourself, that's generally when we start to value prayer. The problem with that is not that you're, you're sinning by doing well. That's not what I'm saying at all. The problem there is, that, problem there is that, that we've not cultivated dependency. Because prayer is, is not a magic amulet. Prayer is like, it, it's a, one preacher calls it a, a wartime walkie-talkie. It's like to communicate with home base, like it's the open channel all the time while you're in the battlefield. So instead of seeing ourselves in such a light that we bring God in when we can or when we need to, to like sprinkle some magical pixie dust on us to turn things in our favor in difficult situations, parables like this are, are, are encouraging, even assuming that really what's at the heart of it is this constant sense of need. And, and the better you get at life, the less likely you're going to remember that we are needy widows all. We're all her in this story. We're all her. This is good news for the poor that Jesus has brought. It's not good news for full people that have it all together. It's not good news to know that God doesn't respect that at all. God looks at all your, your goodness and your work and your effort, and, and yeah, it, it's, it does nothing for him. He will not accept it. It's the righteousness of Christ alone that God will accept for performance. 
And so it, it's, dependence then doesn't become about how much money you have or how well you're doing or not doing. Dependence becomes a sense of self-awareness about who I really am in light of who God actually is. And once that gets ironed out, I begin to see everything else for what it is more and more. And I realize, you know, maybe, maybe I'm, I'm not responsible for how good I have it. And I actually am as in need as the person I would look down on for being so dependent and needy. What we need to know in our prayers, whether we have it together, whether we don't, is that God is listening all the time. God is listening. God doesn't forget. And he will answer his elect. This is the promise that is the foundation of my prayers and the hope in all my pain that God will give me justice against my adversaries, all of them. God is more than aware of the pain we all go through by being mistreated. God sees it. He knows it. He remembers it. We cry out with David in Psalm 56, day and night, knowing that he has put all our tears in a bottle. Every moment of pain is written in his book and he will heal it all. He will wipe away every tear from our eyes. So you remember that when the tears are streaming down your face because nothing makes sense, nothing's coming through. It feels like your prayers are hitting the ceiling, that every tear that drops off of your cheeks, God is catching them all. But even more so, even more so, God will give me justice against my most threatening adversary, death. What Jesus Christ accomplished for all who believe is so perfect and so powerful and so strong that now my final deliverance is not something that God is reluctantly obligated to do so that I will leave him alone with my burdens. The salvation of God's elect ones is just because Jesus has vindicated his Father's righteousness by his death. The blood and righteousness of Jesus are my strong and perfect plea before the true judge of heaven and earth. Therefore, based on that, because Jesus has purchased me, because God chose me, all who believe, he hears every cry of mine. As through Christ he has chosen and accepted me as his very own. I, in the needy widow whose only hope is that the judge will hear my case and bring me justice. And in Christ, this promise is sure for all who believe. So when that adversary, when death comes to demand justice from the great judge, Jesus will stand in my place, hold out nail-scarred hands and roar back over death that it is finished for this one. Justice has been served on me so the debt is paid. Jesus is why God can talk about justice for us and it not be terrifying. And I would say that is precisely what is so hard to keep believing. Not that God will be there. I, I think we normally, generally believe that, even if it's subconscious, that God will be there. We just wonder where he is. We don't generally, generally speaking, we don't think he's not there. We just don't know where he is. I think what is so hard to keep believing is that it's finished. That justice will come because of Christ. Christ. Will the Son of Man find people believing that he really was enough when he returns? Or will he find people busy trying to earn their salvation in their own strength, even though he said, this is the work of God, to believe the one he has sent? Will the Son of Man find people believing that at the cross Jesus took what we deserved so that we could have what he deserves? This is justice in God's economy. And he has promised to give it to all who believe. This is the foundation of my prayer. 
This is the hope in all my pain. That God will keep his promise to me because he made me his own. So we, do we know what that means? That no matter what is happening to me in any given moment, the bird's eye view is that in those things, God is actively working to keep his promises to me. God has not promised to hear an answer only if I behave. It's not based on that. It's not based on whether or not I perform. It's not based on whether or not I'm worthy. The cross means I'm not. That question has been answered. (coughs) That's not my foundation. That's not where my hope is. God has promised by his own name to answer me. Because against all the odds, he loves me. He loves us. So don't think, not for one second, that God is anything like an unrighteous judge who can be pushed or bribed or needs to be pushed into acting. It's the point of the text. No, no, no. You are mine. You're mine. He's a much better father. I was genuinely so annoyed with my boy asking me for that bag of candy that last night when we finally got out, like we pulled into Walmart to buy the candy I told him that. I opened the side door of the van and he goes, Dad, uh, are we going to buy my candy? I'm like, son! Right? I'm, it's, it's, it's never like that. Ever. And imagine that he's hearing billions of people crying day and night. I mean, we go through what we go through, and it is all relative. We go through what we grow through, go through. North Koreans are crying out day and night, our North Korean brethren, day and night, as they're hiding and running. Indonesian Christians are crying day and night. Syrian Christians are crying day and night. And he's just hearing all of it. He hears it from America and Canada and Greenland and Eastern Europe and Jerusalem and all that. He just, it's just, he just hears it and hears it and hears it. And never once, not one time does he go, Never, ever, ever. That's preci- the unrighteous judge is precisely what God is not like. He chose us, he bought us, and he will forever treat us like his own dear children. He's a better father than me, infinitely speaking. So he isn't annoyed or bothered by our continual coming and pleading. He's not like us. He invites us to keep coming and never lose heart. He can handle it. He hears, and no matter what, no matter what, that day will come that he holds our face in his hands. That will happen, and none of us will ever doubt again whether or not he loves us. When we look into those eyes, and I'm not trying to make it silly or sentimental or But that day will come in the new heavens and the new earth that he takes hold of us and we take hold of him. And he'll have enough time for all of us. So keep praying. Keep pressing. Keep leaning in. He's ours. God doesn't answer us based purely on the moment. We have to remember this. God isn't locked into tunnel vision when he hears us pray, that he can only see what we can see. That's why the answers are what they are. Based on what we're able to see, that's not how God sees. God answers us finally, ultimately, from his vantage point of eternity, where he knows and and counsels, controls all things for his glory and for our good. So as you pray out of your moment, you remember this, As you pray in your moment, landlocked, earthlocked, God has the end in view. God has all the information. And he has committed himself to the salvation of his people, the ones Jesus calls his elect here. So God listens to our cries. He knows when he listens, he knows that he's going to give us justice. Regardless of what he is going to do in this given moment, he knows he's going to give us justice. He knows he's going to make it all whole and right. So when it feels like the only thing that's true is that there's this delay, 
God is moving closer and moving closer and moving closer to justice, not farther away from it. When he doesn't give the answer we believe that we need, it is not apathy. It's not cold, unrighteous, judge-like indifference. It is never that. It's a sign that he knows he is going to keep his promise to you. That's always happening when you pray. So it's never that he's like, yeah, I I don't don't have time for this, or I don't care, or why are you crying about that? The answer is always, justice is coming. We're not getting farther from it. We're getting closer to it. It's a sign that God knows he's going to keep his promises. So let that give you hope. Let that give you hope. That's why we, we, when we look at Jesus saying, nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? This is why we would never walk away from him. This, this promise, this certainty is why we would never give up on our faith. Because our foundation for believing it is a promise that God has made to us, not something we're trying to work into securing for ourselves. It isn't my goodness or my performance that determines whether or not I will get what he has promised me. It is God's commitment to his word that is my foundation all the time. Just There are times when the answer is not going to be what I want it to be, but I always know that justice is coming. Always. Regardless of what my answer is for any question in the here and now. And God isn't annoyed with us. He isn't responding to us because he just wants us to leave him alone. Jesus told this parable so that this needy widow would be our justification for constantly crying out to him, knowing that he isn't frustrated with us. He wants you to know that God's attitude towards you is never like this. It's a precious thing for Jesus to tell his people. Especially when they're all needy widows, whether they realize it or not. He's moving closer and closer to us all the time. (coughs) Four, he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. For he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night nor the arrow that flies by day nor the pestilence that stalks in darkness nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not Come near you. You will only look with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord your dwelling place. The Most High who is my refuge. No evil should be allowed to befall you. No plague come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you. To guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent you will trample underfoot. And God says over you, because he holds fast to me in love, I will deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. When he calls to me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Psalm 91. And all of that is true for Jesus. And therefore, all of it is true for all who are in him. Needy widows all. So, beloved, as we close this morning, if you need to come and pray, if you need 
to lay things out before the Lord, then do it if you want to. The front's open. Pray when you get home. Pray when you need to pray. And don't stop. All right? There's no reason to lose heart. None. Thanks again for joining us. And if you have any questions about today's recording, Gateway Church, or what it means to follow Jesus Christ, you can reach us through the contact section of our website, gwbrawley.org.